We start now the insect olfaction detection around the globe in 24 hours. The co-hosts for these meetings are uh, myself, Walter Leal, here from the University of California, Davis, uh, Winand van der Goss van Natters from Cardiff University. Winand, how's the weather there? Hi, hi Walter. Yes, greetings from the UK across the Atlantic Ocean. The weather is good and it is fantastic to have such a global community participating in the symposium. Back to you. Thank you, thank you, Winand. Winand is going to be there, uh, participating now and also uh, when this meeting goes next to Coral War in Australia. At this point, she's uh, uh, saving energy, sleeping to get enough energy to be able to be here late afternoon for us and early morning uh, on this Thursday in Australia. Uh, we have the co-moderators. Each segment of the meeting would have a co-moderator. In our case here in the PDD session, we have Karen Menuz uh, from Yukon that's going to co-moderate this segment with me. Uh, and also uh, we have for questions and answers, we have two students, one biochemistry student, uh, Kelly Brandt, and one student uh, from the NEPB, Neurophysiology and Behavior Program here at UC Davis, Efrain Vasquez. Uh, they are going to be helping here. So when you see me multitasking, I normally can multitask to a certain degree, but if you see me talking and typing to you at the same time, that's not me actually, it's either Kelly or Efrain that they are doing that job. Thank you very much for these students uh, to be uh, here today. So, like I said, uh, in this segment, that's so called the PDT, the uh, Pacific Daylight Time. We have a, a number of excellent keynote speakers. We are going to start uh, with Josefina Del Delmarmo. She's the uh, she's going to give in the open lecture here today. Uh, and then we have Anupama Dahanuka, Jeff Rivo, Les Vosso, uh, Les Vosso uh, for. 15 or 20 years, I pronounced that name wrong, but I didn't know that the H is Simon, Les Vosso, uh, Zain Said, uh, and Kedong. Kedong is going to be a, a bridge speaker. And in the meantime, we are going to have uh, other contributors to the presentations by Ben Matthews, Carolina Reiserman, Chris Potter, Craig Montel, Erica Platner, Hannah De Week, Jason Pitts, Jessica Zang, Mahmoud Demis. Priti Sarin, uh, myself, and Zepeng Yao. So we are, we are now uh, going to start here sharing the presentation again. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you, Professor Jean Hildebrand, who's going to give a preface, an open address here. Jean Hildebrand is Regents Professor of the University of Arizona. He is also the Foreign Secretary of the National Academy of Science, I believe for the second term, and a pioneer on, in the field of insect olfaction. John, thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you, Walter. Hello, colleagues, and welcome once again to the Insect Olfaction and Taste in 24 Hours Around the Globe. Invented, organized, and facilitated by Walter Leal and his team, uh, Winand and Coral, this meeting is unlike any other I've experienced in my long career. It marks the invention of a unique meeting scheme that enables participation of colleagues everywhere, maybe even the space station for all we know. I'm very grateful to Walter for inviting me to light the inaugural torch for this international celebration of research on insect chemical senses with over 1400 registered participants, which is absolutely unprecedented for our field. This meeting already offers evidence of the widespread and growing interest in our science. So fasten your seatbelts. The presentations in this virtual meeting Today's rising and established leaders of our field surely will report many of the latest research findings in insect chemical senses and direct our attention and imagination to opportunities that lie ahead. Now, however, in my brief and admittedly very personal prefatory remarks, I want to recall with you our roots, the roots of our field and our own roots as scientists. <clears throat> 
I urge you all to join me in thinking about those whose work laid the foundation for our field and those who stimulated our own personal interests and efforts. It is often said that we stand on the shoulders of those who preceded us, and we who have chosen this fascinating field are no exception. I will illustrate my point in a very personal way by sharing with you my acknowledgement of the founders who greatly influenced me personally. I hope my own example will stimulate your thoughts about key scientists who have had important impacts on you and on the work you do. For me, the story is one of chance and serendipity, and I imagine the same has been true for almost all of you. As an undergraduate student, I started in research working on bacteria in the laboratory of the biochemist John Law. At that time, he was beginning to redirect his research to problems in insect biochemistry. And among other projects, he was collaborating with the biologist E.O. Wilson in studies of ant pheromones. The term pheromone had been invented only three years earlier in 1959 in Germany by Peter Carlson and Martin Luscher. And in that same year, another German, Adolf Butenandt and his group had reported the first chemical identification of an insect pheromone, the silk moth sex attracted bombicol. I read their seminal papers and then and there, my own interest in pheromones was ignited. But my research on bacteria continued even into my work as a PhD student. Then in 1966, I learned about the invention of a new multidisciplinary scientific field called neurobiology. And purely by chance, around the same time, I read a small then new book called Nerve Cells and Insect Behavior by another giant of insect research, Kenneth Roeder. Those experiences suggested to me that it should be possible to figure out how an insect's nervous system mediates behavioral responses to chemical stimuli such as pheromones. Now I knew what I wanted to do in science, but how could I do that? I decided to move into the new field of neurobiology as a postdoc and had the very good fortune to be welcomed to the lab of Edward Kravitz, one of the founders of the first academic departments of neurobiology, that at Harvard Medical School. Ed wasn't working with insects at the time, but instead was investigating synaptic mechanisms in lobsters, those big experimentally favorable and tasty decapod cousins of insects. Building on that experience, I went on to develop my own independent research lab and program devoted to the neurobiology and behavior of insects. And because my background was a mixture of chemistry, biochemistry, and neurobiology, what better could I study than the chemical senses? My introduction to insect pheromones a decade earlier, thanks to John Law and Ed Wilson, sharpened my focus. And thus for the past 50 years, I've worked on insect olfaction. It was a powerful and it's the powerful and inspiring influence of those senior scientists, and no particular spark in me that showed me the way and lit my fire. Then as I found my way in my chosen field and began to contribute to it, I had perhaps the most important chance encounter of all. At a biochemistry conference in Sweden, I met Dietrich Schneider, the director of a renowned research group at the Max Planck Institute for Behavioral Physiology in Seewiesen. I had read his important 1969 article in Science entitled Insect Olfaction Deciphering System for Chemical Messages. And there he was at the conference. He warmly welcomed my self-introduction and scientific questions. And we thus began an enduring friendship and de facto master apprentice relationship that powerfully affect me to this day. What's more, Meeting Schneider opened a door for me through which I became a kind of adopted unofficial member of his group, affectionately known as Schneider House. Later in this meeting, you will hear from my closest collaborator, mentor and friend from that family, Karl Ernst Keisling. His beautiful physiological, biophysical and modeling studies laid a firm foundation for what our field has learned subsequently about the molecular mechanisms underlying the responses of olfactory receptor cells to their chemical stimuli. Others in Schneider's scientific family also became dear colleagues and teachers for me, including Jürgen Burke, Ernst Kramer, Ernst Priesner, and Alexander Steinbrecht. 
much of my basic knowledge of insect olfaction I learned from that remarkable group. And I urge you all to read and learn from their foundational research publications. Now I could go on like this because the value of encounters and interactions with others in our field never ends, but my time doesn't allow for that. In closing, I would like to acknowledge the key roots of the adventure we now begin. This extraordinary meeting inherits the spirit of at least two wonderful previous forums. The first is the International Chemo Reception Workshop on Insects, or ICWI. Initiated in 1971 in Gainesville, Florida, ICWI meetings were very informal, candid, delightful gatherings of a small number of researchers in our field. The meetings served to introduce participants to techniques that were new to them, and for the practitioners of those methods to share experiences and solutions to problems they were encountering. ICWI meetings were also catalysts for new friendships and collaborations, and they tended to be a lot of fun. The last ICWI meeting took place in 2009 in Kona, Hawaii. Among the driving forces for organizing ICWI meetings were Sid Meier, Tom Payne, Ring Carde, and Eric Jang. And then there's the outstanding European Symposium on Insect Taste and Olfaction. ESITO was inaugurated in 1989 in Sardinia, and the series has continued with gatherings every other year since then, alternating between Sardinia and other venues in Germany, Sweden, and once in Russia. The inspiration behind ESITO came from Anna Maria Anjoy, Bill Hansen, and Carlos Keisling and others have done very well in organizing recent ACITO meetings and ensuring their continuation. Now, thanks to the imagination, energy, and generosity of Walter Leal and his co-organizers, we embark on a most worthy 21st century successor to the tradition of Iqui and Asito, this time transcending the constraints of time and space to build and inspire a community that founders of our field could not have imagined. Have a great meeting. Thank you very much, John. Thank you so much. Uh, we're now moving on and we're going to have the the open lecture, we have now 452 uh, participants logging in and we have uh, 132 people watching on YouTube. We are delighted to introduce the speaker today to give the open lecture, uh, Josefina de Marmol. Uh, she is a K99 postdoctoral fellow, which is a pathway to independence award for those that are not from the United States, are not familiar with this kind of award. She's a member of the Vanessa Root Lab uh, from the Rockefeller University. And the, the great news that in 2022, she will join the faculty of Harvard Medical School. Uh, Josefina is an Argentina, and I am originally from Brazil. So I invited her to give this open lecture. And in the meantime, Brazil and Argentina played in the Copa America and Argentina won. So I wanted to downgrade her to a poster presentation, but we now remind me there will be no poster presentation in a meeting like this nature. So uh, at the end of the day, we realized that Messi is the best soccer player. Argentina produces a wonderful Malbec wine. Rio de Janeiro may, might have Christ the Redeemer, but Argentina has the Pope and also Josefina de Marmol. Josefina. Thanks for being here today. Um, thank you so much, uh, Walter, for that really kind introduction. And for I actually was wondering if you were going to uh, maintain the invitation after what happened exactly one month uh, today. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for your introduction. Thank you to um, Dr. War and Dr. Van der Goes van Natters for this fantastic idea of um, this meeting. And um, it's a real honor for me to talk in front of this audience. I have to say, I'm, I think I'm more nervous now than I was for my job interviews. Um, and that, that's really because my work, what I'm going to present today, um, really builds upon many decades of um, beautiful, rigorous work um, and insights produced by the many um, labs that will be participating in this symposium. So I'm really honored to have been invited to uh, kick off the event. And um, echoing what Dr. Hillerman was saying, it's true, this field is wonderful in uniting people that come from very many different perspectives. And in my case, I have a very long-standing interest in sensory biology, because if you think about it, everything that we perceive from 
the world around us initially depends on how our sensory receptors evolve to detect the chemical and physical signals from the environment. And one sensory modality that faces a remarkable challenge is olfaction, because the chemical world is incredibly complex, is composed of millions of different volatile molecules, and often what we think of as a very distinctive smell, like the smell of coffee, is actually comprised of hundreds of different compounds, and I'm only showing a handful of them here. But these compounds are not chemically related <clears throat> in any obvious way, nor do any of these compounds individually smell like coffee. So the extraordinary task of the olfactory system is to detect and discriminate amongst this uh, extremely complex multidimensional chemical space. And this is a unique challenge amongst sensory modalities. For example, we can think of vision as a detection of light waves. And so we can use quantitative metrics to describe visual stimuli, such as the wavelength or the amplitude that directly relates to a visual percept like the color or the intensity. And so animals have uh, very cleverly leveraged these parameters. And in humans, for example, a simple strategy based on wavelength detection allows only three receptors to detect um, the rainbow of colors that conform our visual spectrum. And these receptors have a quantitatively defined range of sensitivity. But for olfaction, there are no equivalent metrics that can um, scale linearly and relate um, a chemical group or a chemical characteristic to an other person. There is no way to directly link um, uh, chemical properties to their meaning. So how do olfactory receptors cope with this diversity? And naturally, one possibility would be to have a single receptor for each uh, type of compound that the animal detects. But this would be um, highly restrictive in allowing us to detect only a small and um, invariant set of molecules. So through work done in mammalian and in insect um, uh, models in the past decades, we know that instead, most animals evolved receptors that can each detect often dozens of different types of molecules and that overlap in their receptive fields. And this substantially expands the um, chemical space that is detected, allowing a comparatively smaller number of receptors to detect millions of different compounds. But it also introduces a, a delicate a balance or a trade-off between um, detection and discrimination. And so in most animals, there are some receptors that are highly specific for certain cues that are often um, of, of heightened ecological or ethological relevance, like pheromones or toxin cues. But most receptors are what we call broadly tuned and detect a wide range of chemically and structurally diverse compounds. The molecular principles that govern the, the, the chemical recognition properties of olfactory receptors are a real enigma, uh, even some um, uh, decades after the discovery of these proteins. Because from a biochemical perspective, the fact that these receptors can bind dozens of different compounds makes them unlikely to operate through a um, canonical lock and key binding mechanism that governs the interaction between hundreds of other receptors and their ligands. So instead, other mechanisms have been proposed. For example, the existence of multiple binding sites could in principle account for some of this um, promiscuity. The uh, autotope theory creatively co-opted um, classic concepts from immunology, proposing that individual chemical features of uh, molecules or moieties are recognized sort of like, like epitopes. And another notable theory, for example, argues that what is being recognized is um, not the individual chemical features, but the vibrational frequencies that are emitted by compounds, for example. So ultimately, though, this, the reality is that this is something that we don't know for a fact. Um, we don't know how olfactory receptors detect and discriminate the ligands at the structural level. And this is because despite knowing the identity of these proteins for decades now, no atomic structure of an older gated olfactory receptor uh, from any species have been elucidated. And so um, we really had no direct view, snapshot of the binding pocket or how it binds others. So in the rural lab, I have been working on obtaining a structural understanding of olfactory detection. And I focus on insects because as 
I think this audience knows better than any other, uh, insects are an incredibly rich model for the study of olfaction with uh, sophisticated olfactory driven behavioral adaptations that sculpt their receptors into one of the largest families uh, of receptors that we know of. Now, one of the reasons we don't have structures of olfactory receptors yet is because in vitro they have been um, uh, particularly challenging for expression and, and, and purification. And in the case of insect olfactory receptors, this is in part because they are heteromeric. They're composed of a subunit that is the proper um, olfactory receptor that binds others. And there is also a co-receptor subunit that we call ORCO that is inert. And this has uh, been biochemically particularly challenging for study. But recently, <clears throat> the genomes of more basal insect species have been sequenced, suggesting that there are species like the jumping bristletail that have only olfactory receptors in the genome um, and no co-receptors. And this suggests that there might be olfactory receptors that operate as homers. And this has very interesting implications for the evolution of olfaction in insects, but also for structural studies because um, homomeric receptors would significantly reduce this biochemical challenge and offer an inroad for us to study them from a structural perspective. And so I focus on the receptors of this jumping bristle tail and I began by deorphanizing them using an in vitro fluorescence calcium assay, measuring the response of these receptors to a panel of 54 compounds. And on top, uh, here on the top, you can see the tuning curves for two of these receptors, OR1 and OR5, and below are the dose response curves for some of their ligands. And you can clearly see that these indeed respond to others with distinct um, other specificities and tuning breaths. But you can also see that this receptor here, OR5, it is activated by many uh, structurally and chemically diverse compounds that share no obvious feature. And this includes um, canonical others like eugenol, the smell of cloves, or limonin, but it also includes DEET. And as you all know, DEET is the uh, very potent insect repellent whose mode of action has been at the center of intense study and it has been um, um, linked to olfactory receptors in many ways, though not structurally. Now, furthermore, in electrophysiological recordings in vitro, I observe this canonical um, other gated currents with a very slow on rate. Um, they're, they're very flickery, they have very small single channel conductance, and these are all features that uh, our group and, and other groups have uh, recorded as canonical features of insect olfactory receptors. And so I chose to focus on OR5 because it allows me to ask um, how can a single receptor accommodate this chemical diversity? And making use of recent advances in cryoelectromicroscopy, I was able to determine the uh, atomic resolution structure of OR5. And here I'm showing you the intact micelle, the, the density of the particle, and inside sits the channel, which assembles as a tetramer embedded in the lipid membrane, uh, with all four subunits surrounding uh, the putative channel pore. And this structure offered a lot of interesting insights into this family of receptors, but today what I will uh, um, focus on is perhaps one of the most long awaited insights, which is in regards to the structural and chemical basis of odor detection. So to do this, I saw the structure of this receptor, um, both unbound and in complex with the other eugenol. And so here's the unbound structure in a side and a top view. And in the side view, I removed the front and the back subunit so that you can focus on, on the pore. Now you can see in the unbound state that the helices at the top of the pore are constricted, suggesting that it's possibly in a closed or, or not conductive state. And here is the bound structure, um, again in a side and a, in a side and a top view. And in this um, um, bound structure, we could clearly see that the pore has dilated and it's in what appears to be an open state. So let's take a closer look at this. If we zoom into the pore, we see that in the unbound state, um, there is a valin, um, a, a hydrophobic residue from each um, pore helis that is facing the lumen of the pore and yields a diameter of 5.3 angstroms. And this is a small diameter, but it's also hydrophobic, so altogether it's unlikely to be uh, a conductive state of the pore. And if we look in the bound structure, we see that, first of all, the diameter has 
indeed dilated to over nine angstroms, but also we see that the valine that was facing the, the, the lumen has now moved out of the lumen, and now there is a glutamine uh, in its place. And glutamine is a polar residue that can offer a much more favorable environment for the passage of ions. So a very small conformational change switches the pore from a um, hydrophobic narrow constriction to a hydrophilic wider opening. And this was um, quite satisfying in a way because a well-known feature of olfaction across many animals is that uh, in many cases, the odorants bind with generally low um, affinity. So a question always was, what kind of conformational change can be um, elicited by these low affinity ligands? And what we can see is that by both changing uh, not just the diameter, but the chemical uh, composition of the pore lumen, a very small conformational change can effectively gate this channel. So now that we've confirmed that we have an open channel, we can go look for the binding pocket in the bound structure. So here is the original bound structure from the top. And if we take a slab uh, near the extracellular leaflet, we soon find this cavity in the transmembrane region of each subunit. And here's where we found the density for uh, eugenol. And this density um, is of the expected size and shape, and it allows us to place the ligand here with with confidence. We're going to zoom into the binding site and take a closer look um, at the residue surrounding. And what we can immediately see is that um, the ligand binding site is composed of a majority of hydrophobic and aromatic residues. And by um, analyzing the position of eugenol of and the distances with the surrounding residues, uh, we see that eugenol interacts through mostly hydrophobic interactions and pi stacking with residues that are distributed throughout the entire pocket. Um, and, and this reminds of structural work done in other unbinding proteins where hydrophobic um, residues have been found at the core of, of some of these interactions. Uh, for example, eugenol can interact through pi stacking with this tryptophan um, over here, or this tyrosine in S6, um, or this other tyrosine in S2. And interestingly, the geometry does not really allow for the formation of any hydrogen bonds or um, extensive polar interactions. And hydrogen bonds or polar interactions are more um, definitely are more anchoring types of interactions because they have stronger geometrical uh, constraints. So this raises the interesting possibility that the recognition of eugenol by this receptor is not based off of uh, specific interactions with individual chemical groups or residues, but rather by this um, non-directional distributed interactions between the ligand as a whole uh, and the pocket. And so, indeed, if we mutate most of these residues in the binding pocket into alanine, we significantly change the uh, or diminish the apparent affinity of eugenol. And however, as a sort of uh, control, if we mutate residues that are immediately next to the pocket but that are not directly interacting with the ligand, um, the effect is uh, minimal or null. And these two residues that I'm referring to are not in this uh, image. They, I think they'll show up in a uh, later slide. So we've located the eugenol binding site, but now we want to know, could this pocket accommodate other ligands that activate this channel? And so for this, I first use docking, which is a um, computational modeling approach that allowed us, allows us to ask how would um, a, a ligand placed in this cavity interact with the binding site. And what I found is that these other structurally diverse ligands that I showed you before and have very different chemical properties, like octanol or limonene or geosmine or butyrate, and essentially all of the ligands that activate this receptor, they can be favorably docked in here, all predicted to establish hydrophobic um, distributed interactions with the surrounding residues, just like we observed experimentally for eugenol. So these um, modeling results would suggest that indeed this receptor could detect all these ligands with a single promiscuous binding site that recognizes ligands uh, not through particular autotopes or specific interactions, but as a whole. And so naturally the next step was to evaluate this model. And so for this, I solved the structure of this receptor in complex with another ligand, and I chose DIT because um, DIT is a ligand that is chemically and structurally very distinct from eugenol, but it is also of special interest 
for, um, for the biology of, of vector-borne diseases. And so first I found that the deed band structure is also open, which you can see here on the left. And then I found the density for deed in the exact same pocket where I had found the density for huge genome. And this density now um, really matches the expected size and shape of deed. So we can uh, confidently say now that this is a binding site that is shared at least for original and deed. And now going a little further, now that we can visualize this receptor in the presence of these two different ligands, we can also start thinking about how this pocket can accommodate these structurally diverse compounds. And we see that the structure of the pocket is uh, very similar in the presence of eugenol and deed, meaning that there are no major rearrangements that uh, seem to be necessary to fit these ligands, but there are slight differences that um, allow us to start making some predictions. And for example, we see that this methionine here, uh, in the presence of deed, of deed, it needs to move out of the way to avoid a steric clash with deed, whose density protrudes further into this region. And so I picked this methionine and mutated it into a smaller residue, still hydrophobic availing, hoping that uh, a smaller site in here might improve uh, the binding of deed. And this is indeed what we found. Mutation of this methionine into valine actually increases the uh, apparent affinity for deed, as shown here as a left shift in the dose response curve, and it decreases the apparent affinity for the smaller ligand, eugenol, um, presumably because the absence of this side chain, of this long side chain here, leaves uh, a distance that is now too um, large for eugenol to effectively interact with this side of the pocket. And then finally, if this binding site is uh, shared for all the ligands in our panel, as was suggested by our computational docking experiments, this mutation should have an effect on the binding of all the ligands. And indeed, again, this is what we find. Um, a small valine mutation in the binding pocket affects the response to all the ligands that activate this receptor. And this further supports the idea that this is indeed a shared binding site um, not just for eugenol and D, but for all the ligands that activate uh, this receptor. And so I want uh, I um, to summarize some of the insights that we just learned um, from this first uh, snapshot of other recognition by receptors. And we learned that this receptor relies on hydrophobic and non-directional distributed interactions to detect these ligands. And because these are comparatively weak interactions, um, and and the ligands are rather small, this is uh, generally well aligned with the general law of parent affinity of the agonists. And we also learned that a small conformational change is sufficient to gate the ion conduction pathway, which is consistent with the previous observation as this um, small conformational change will provide a low energetic barrier to gating, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, but it is also consistent with the electrophysiological behavior of the channel because the channels are very flickery um, and the open and closed state are um, energetically very close. Now, looking forward, what it will be really interesting is to, um, to understand the broader principles and mechanisms that detect how the structural features of complements of receptors um, um, determine the way that animals encode the world around them. And another point um, that comes from this, from this work is that uh, we saw how the responses to those sense of odorants are highly intertwined um, by the shared binding site. And this suggests that even small sequence variation can have uh, far-reaching consequences in other coding, which is something that was also very satisfying to see from the structural perspective, because um, many labs have been doing amazing work looking at how small um, interspecific um, variation in receptors can greatly impact their olfactory capabilities. So finding the structural correlate for these observations was, was really um, very pleasing. And, and, and again, this then opens the door to continue approaching the issue of uh, studying protein sequence variation of receptors and how it impacts their olfactory capabilities from a structural perspective. And then finally, I'd like to finish by uh, addressing a, um, a, burn, a burning question that I think um, uh, would be very interesting for, for this audience, which is, um, to ask whether this insight is unique to this receptor OR5 or could help us understand the function and tuning of other receptors. And so an immediate um, test case is OR1, 
uh, from the jumping bristle tail because this is another receptor that um, has its own um, very own tuning specificity and tuning breadth um, and that I showed you um, earlier today. And this is less than 40% identical in sequence to OR5, uh, which from a protein perspective is five minutes um, remaining. It's really not that much. Um, but so now that we have located the pocket in OR5, we can identify the residues in OR1 that align to the residues in the pocket if, if of OR5. And so now we can make a list of putative pocket residues in OR1. And when we mutate um, these putative residues in OR1, we see that much like we saw in OR5, uh, the residues that are aligned to those of the pocket of OR5 have a dramatic effect in ligand binding. And this, is, this really truly mirrors um, the structural observations in OR5, even down to the control residues, the residues that are here in purple, that in OR5 are, um, facing, are near the pocket residues, but facing away, and therefore not interacting with usual. Um, and it seems that in OR1, uh, down to the orientation of the helices, is the, there is a, a, a good um, mirroring uh, so that these residues are here too, um, not as involving binding. And um, this was, um, sorry, uh, this was also, um, I think, extremely satisfying for us because um, when we look at work, again, done by many groups in the past, um, looking at the effect of individual mutations in over tuning, we found that a lot of these mutations map to the binding pocket of OR5. So this is, um, I think, really encouraging to imagine that we can um, use structure to guide um, more, um, more hypotheses about the ligand pocket, ligand binding pocket of other receptors um, based on the structure determinations of family members of this uh, receptor family. And so with that, I'd like to um, end by thanking you all for your attention and thanking again, uh, Walter, um, Coral, and Winant for um, the ideation of this wonderful event and organizing this event and inviting me to participate. Um, I'd also like to thank the funding sources, um, the Leon Levy Foundation, the NIDCD, the Rockefeller University, uh, and especially thanks various members of the lab, um, but I think chiefly Vanessa Ruta, my mentor, um, for a, a, an extraordinary vision and support um, of postdocs and, and trainees. Uh, I'd also like to mention uh, research assistant Kenzie, who was really instrumental in this project, um, and then various members of the Rockefeller community who were um, of, of key um, support, uh, Leslie Bossel, Mary Beth Hatton, uh, and the members of the Crarium Resource Center. And with that, I like to um, no, yes, before I forget, um, as, as Walter mentioned, I'll be moving on to an independent position next year, um, joining the faculty at Harvard Medical School, where I will be further exploring these questions of the structural um, basis of olfaction in insects, and I'm, um, I'll be actively recruiting postdocs and research assistants, so if you have an interest in studying the structure of receptors and how they underlie um, cool olfactory adaptations, please don't hesitate to reach out. And so, yeah, that, with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Very nice. Thank you very much, Josefina. That's a wonderful presentation. If you did not uh, attend it from the beginning, are you going to have a chance to go and watch the video? Also, the paper was published last week in Nature. Uh, so we would like to welcome all 506 participants that are now logged in and the 48 of them that are watching uh, via YouTube. Thank you very much. We are going to take your questions. For those here on Zoom, uh, please type your questions if you didn't do that yet uh, in the chat, uh, in question and answer, sorry. So, sorry. Uh, and the, for those on YouTube, we're going to try to pick and see if you can also look at your questions. So we move on now. Uh, uh, and the, uh, this particular presentation requires uh, a commentary. And I ask you, Professor John Clark, who is a, a distinguished professor from uh, Harvard University, uh, Harvard Medical School. He's a professor of uh, biological chemistry and the molecular pharmacology. Uh, I ask you, John, because he, he was the first person to determine the first structure of an 
uh, pheromone binding protein. Back 20 years ago in collaboration with us, uh, Jean solved the extract of, of the Bombix Mori PBP1. And now we have it, so many structures of odorant binding protein that have been solved by crystallography and enema. So I thought that John would be a good person to that. I didn't realize when I invited him that Josephine is going to be a faculty in the same department. And John disclosed that to me. And I said, there is no problem because you are the best person to do this commentary. John, thank you very much for being here today. John Clark, the floor is yours now, John. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Walter. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking Josefina for a lovely talk. It, it was an awesome technical achievement uh, to determine those structures. And uh, she just did a lovely job of giving us a guided tour to a remarkable uh, molecular machine. Um, I'd like to, uh, I was asked to sort of put it in a context, and I'd like to take advantage of something that John Hildebrand reminded us of, that is the historical roots and somewhat personal roots of our field. And uh, personally, I'm uh, sort of a, uh, an outlier to this field, but uh, why I'm in, one of the reasons I'm interested in it is I grew up near the headquarters of, uh, in the US of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, and the National Security Agency, the NSA. And, um, uh, they did a lot of work on codes, and I've been very interested uh, in codes uh, ever, ever since. And uh, what this whole session, 24 hours, is about, in, in some ways, is establishing the olfactory code for insect uh, chemoreception. And uh, uh, Josefina, Josefina, reminded us when she said that it was a real enigma how this whole thing could work. And that reminded me of uh, the real enigma. That is one of the best examples of code uh, breaking is during the Second World War uh, when the enigma code uh, was, uh, um, uh, was broken so that the allies uh, could read messages uh, that were being exchanged uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the military. And uh, the code was used, uh, used a machine called the Enigma machine, which in many ways has some vague connections with odorant receptors. The Enigma machine has many different wheels, just as the odorant reception um, apparatus has many different receptors and each wheel could be turned to, to tune in to a, diff to a different thing. And the problem was really figuring out the combinations. And that is why Alan Turing and his colleagues are still remembered today for their uh, heroic and, and really brilliant uh, breaking, uh, breaking uh, of the code. And so what we've heard today, to put it in that context, is that um, Josefina has told us about what the Enigma machine looks like. That is, she's opened up the panels so you can see how, how things move, where things bind, how things open, how things close, and, uh, and, and shown us that, uh, and more importantly, that while there are many different odor receptors there, uh, and they're not the same, but they're all very similar. And so understanding one gives us some idea <clears throat> of how all of them work. And I think with that, we can begin to understand what's going on. So this is the beginning of what is uh, a wildly ambitious venture of trying to figure out how all of these different receptors, which are all promiscuous, and all of the different possible odorants, which are all promiscuous, how this can lead how, to a message that somehow an insect can understand to go where uh, it needs it needs to go. So, um, and there are uh, many things like that lying in our future. Uh, I would say the human immune system is like that. There are many different receptors, some similarities, some differences. There's a code. We don't have nearly as much information about that as we do on insect odorants. But there, the, this work has opened up 
some real possibilities to understand some of the most complicated, but also some of the most important signaling mach uh, machines in science. So uh, I'll thank Josefina once again for introducing this, us to this. Thanks. And thank you, John, for your commentary. That was great. So let's move on. Uh, and now let's go to questions and the answers. I'm going to ask Kelly, are there questions from, from uh, students? Yes, thank you, Walter. We actually have a few questions. Um, and our first question is from Alexander. Um, it is, how is the liking? We need, we need to lower down the volume. We need down to lower down the volume of the speaker there. That's give a little bit of feedback. Okay. okay. Sorry uh, about that. Is that better? Okay, I think it's better now. Go ahead. Um, our first question is from Alexander, and it's how is the ligand binding of receptors that have narrow specificity like OR1? Josefina, did you get that question? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, um, John, for a, an incredibly eloquent um, sort of summary of what what the questions I had are um, and a lovely commentary. Um, in, in terms of this question, this is really one of the key things that we want to learn because um, receptors need to have a very defined range of sensitivity to specific compounds. Even the broadly tuned receptors are not non-discriminatory. So there's going to be many different ways in which um, receptors bind different ligands. And particularly for very narrowly tuned <clears throat> receptors, very specific receptors, we definitely expect a, a different um, approach to how it's found, um, for, how, for how it happens. Um, but that will require um, further structural studies. Um, yeah. All right, uh, next question. Um, our next question is from Santosh, and he says, this is simply awesome work. I have one question. How complex or simple molecules do do you have on either side of the bar graph that does, did not elicit responses? And what limitations do you think the odorant receptor has in such cases? Oh, oh, you mean the, um, um, so the ligands that don't activate this receptor. Um, uh, so if I interpret the question um, as uh, if there is any insight to be gained from understanding, the, from looking at the ligands and the structures of the ligands that don't activate this receptor and why they don't. Um, and one of the interesting things is that um, some of the ligands at, at either end in the, in, the, um, in the graph have, for example, a much larger um, um, sort of overall um, um, molecular weight. They're much larger ligands. And if we try to dock these ligands into the pocket, they can simply not fit. There's simply no, um, no um, 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 the geometry will not allow for that ligand to be there. Um, however, there are some ligands that um, actually um, inhibit this receptor, uh, and this also can't be docked in the same pocket. So I think there is a, a real possibility that there's going to be a second binding site or additional binding sites, um, at least for this receptor and maybe for other receptors, for other ligands that are um, very distinct. Right, so uh, Karen, uh, Karen Menuzzi is also a, a, a co-moderator today, and she's asking a question. Karen, can you state that question there on the microphone? Uh, sure. I was just wondering how this structure compares to the structure of ORCO, which do doesn't generally bind, you know, odorants, but we have a known structure for it as well. Yeah, um, this is one of the really fascinating things. I think that even extend the, the, uh, this protein family, Orco, the structure of ORCO and the structure of, of OR5 are remarkably similar structurally, and these two uh, receptors are only 15% sequence identity. It's extremely low. Um, however, they're, they're, the, the organization in the membrane and the tetrameric organization and how it falls is re re really um, remarkably similar. Um, and the binding pocket in ORCO is, is there to an extent, although with many differences. Um, and we, we have sort of ongoing work, um, which we, we, we have some really interesting conclusions as to why ORCO um, would be inert, uh, because it's really one of the key questions. Um, so, so in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it for the very exciting um, sort of developments that come in the future. However, it is, I think, extremely encouraging to find that these two structures are very similar, because what it's speaking of is telling us that all of these receptors that are, as you all know, 
sometimes as little as five or 10% sequence identical, they will likely be, we, we, we will be able to do fairly good models that will allow us to um, sort of gain insight without having to solve the structures of all these receptors. So there is a, a, a remarkable degree of structural conservation, uh, although the sequence conservation is very low. Very good. It looks, looks like we have a very good question from Sinisa, right, Kelly? Yes, we do. So the question is, odorants aerostatically bind to the OR, binding causes conformational changes to allow ion flows across the channel and ORs form tetrametric ion channels. Can you tell us or speculate about whether you think odor gating requires binding of four odorants to each of the OR monomers? Or can the same ion flow be induced by the binding of a single odorant molecule to only one of the four, four ORs that make up the channel? Uh, yeah, this is a fascinating question, especially thinking that most neopteran ORs are heteromeric and they only have two subunits. So in that case, for sure, there is, there is um, only two odorants that could um, possibly um, elicit gating. Um, to study this, one of the things we can do is look at the slope when we do um, sort of those responses and to look at the steepness of um, sort of the activation curve, um, sort of, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the time response of the receptor. Um, and what we see, for example, is that for OR5, um, modeling this, the, the steepness of this slope would tell us that uh, there aren't four steps involved in the opening and there is likely to be less than that. So for OR5, for example, it is likely that not all four subunits need to be bound. However, um, how many uh, actually do need to be bound and, or, or why, or whether that changes with different ligands and their ability to, um, to gate the uh, pore, something that we still don't know and we, we actively want to pursue because it tells us a lot about the mechanistic aspects of, um, of how this family works. There is a question from Greg Pasque uh, asking to compare the structures of the MHOR5 and uh, the ORCO uh, homotetramer. Are there any insights in the evolution of the ORCO core receptors? I look at that. Um, yeah, um, so that's one of the things that we were really trying to understand, which is why um, um, you know most ORs don't assemble as homotetramers. They are not biochemically able, so we think they can't fold, um, but they can assemble with, with ORCO. And um, the, one of the surprising things that we find is that there is no immediate apparent obvious reason. There is not a chunk of ORs that is missing and that would explain why um, you know, they, they can't assemble as homomers um, or wh why they need ORCO for assembly. Um, so, so perhaps this, I think, will require a little bit more of poking around in the receptor and trying to find exactly what um, the intersubunit interact, the, um, the intersubunit surfaces and the, the residues involved, what the role is and why um, ORs and ORCOs um, end up assembling the way they do. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kelly, can you uh, ask this question from the uh, postdoc from Anna de Petris Chauvin? Yeah, sure, of course. So Anna's question is in Drosophilia, they, there are some hints um, that some stages, OR stages might change their odor tuning at different de developmental stages. Do you think there could be a structural change correlating to this? Fascinating. Um, I don't think that this would be explained from the side of the structure of the ORs. I would imagine that it might involve other uh, other other parts of the pathway, um, uh, either related to or expression um, or um, expression of other binding proteins that are able to sort of increase or decrease local concentration of other ones near the membrane and have a, a large impact. Uh, but that's really an interesting question um, that I'll look into more. It's very, very interesting. Uh, there's a question for Marcelo Lorenzo. He asks, he says, uh, uh, thanks for an amazing story, Josefina. That's biased because he's Argentinian too. Uh, <laughs> although he lives in Brazil, uh, but I agree with him. Uh, a lay's main question, and he, uh, he answered that, and the, the bottom of the question is, would the receptor modeling help you predict key ligands like sex pheromones in the near future? Um, we, I think that, um, thank you for the question. Yes, we're very close, um, and I think most of us, or perhaps some of you, have followed developments in, in 
um, sort of protein prediction algorithms and softwares. Um, and there's really exciting um, um, insight that will tell us that it, 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 will, it won't be so um, far off in the near future to try to gain some insight from modeling, um, even when it comes to, to issues of, of specificity. So um, although it's, it's, not, um, it's not a definitive, I, I think it will, it has become, without a fall, it has become much more insightful than, than before. And this will definitely help us locate residues um, and be able to develop hypotheses that we can test experimentally. Uh, so there is an I, anonymous question here. I don't think we addressed that one yet. What difference do you predict you'll see with the binding pocket of a highly specific receptor? Um, so so I, I, I think that there is likely to be um, more uh, specific interactions in some cases, um, or at least in um, in cases of, for example, very distinctive molecules of pheromones that we've seen in other unbinding proteins that the binding pockets have an interesting geometry and some uh, an interesting distribution of the interactions throughout. Um, so I think that they will definitely have different type of interactions. Uh, there might be geometrical constraints. Uh, and in other cases, the question is for me entirely open and that one of the cases is the geosmin receptor because geosmin is a molecule that is um, so it's very boring. Well, it's not boring, but it doesn't really have a lot of chemical features that would allow. Well, uh, Bill, Bill Hunt's in the audience, and he like that. I like to say that it's very boring. <laughs> it's more, chemically speaking, I think it's a fascinating. This is one of the things that I'm really fascinated because geosmin is not a pheromone. A pheromone is extremely different chemically, and so you could imagine the different, you know, different um, sort of mechanisms involved in recognition of pheromones. Geosmin is a terpene. It's very similar. It's, it's very small. It's very hydrophobic. Um, so how or 56A is able to really almost exclusively detect geosmin is a, a real chemical mystery that, that's definitely in the future. Um, uh, Yuko Ishida that's watching from, on YouTube from Japan, he's asking the question, uh, eugenol binds and the, how eugenol is released after the signal is, uh, is conveyed? Yeah, that is a really interesting question. And unfortunately, our unbound structure is overall of lower resolution, um, likely because there is, um, it's not stabilized by the ligand. And so that's something I would really like to understand better, which is how the ligand gets in, how it gets out, and what is exactly the process of, of, um, of linking ligand binding to pore opening mechanistically. Um, so I don't have a great answer for that, but it's definitely one of the really interesting things, especially in the context of other blends, because you know the, the animals are in, in exposed to multiple chemicals at the same time. So how uh, receptors deal with other blends and how that's determined uh, chemically or structurally is a really interesting question. Uh, there is a question here from Anonymous, and I think it's a, it's a good question because overlap with the same question that the Greg uh, uh, asking a panelist also who want to ask, uh, and uh, did you get an opportunity to look at the alpha fold prediction for these uh, or other ORs? Do you see similarities? Everything that talk about the structural biology now is alpha fold, right? Uh, yeah. Your question. Sorry. Didn't hear that, but but in terms of the alpha fold, well, I'm, it's really fascinating. I, I did look at all the the um, so there is a bunch of alpha fold uh, structures that have been deposited as part of the big data drop from the from Uniprod, and you can look at all of those. And I've also done my own um, um, predictions using their their open source software, and it's it 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 performs um, significantly better than other modeling approaches that I had tried before, either homology based or the novel prediction. Um, so it, 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 has, it does a much better job at, um, for example, um, putting the rotomers in the light in the right position so that the pocket more or less retains uh, um, some of the uh, key features. So the, the answer is that it really is very exciting and it is definitely um, a, a huge progress that will impact this, this, um, what we know about these receptors. Uh, Fernando Locatelli asked this question. Uh, it's a very difficult question when you don't have the insect at your disposal. Uh, this, uh, do you have a, uh, an opportunity to uh, see what kind of behavior is associated with the response for this receptor? Uh, we always want to say here in the lab, ask the insect, but the insect is not there for you to ask, right? Um, so I, um, I don't have 
access to these insects. And this is a great place to ask if anybody's working on the jumping bristle tail and want to, uh, you know, have some, some cool experiments, because that's one of the things that will be really interesting. And, and as an animal, it only has five olfactory receptors, which is, you know, if you're trying to study how the, the combinatorial code emerges and how the chemical world is detected by, by you know, finding a minimal system um, is, is ideal. So I don't have any um, uh, insight into the biology of this insect, but it's definitely something that I would love to explore. Uh, thank you very much, Josephine. I think we have moved on uh, uh, to the next presentation. Uh, after this wonderful participation of Josefina. If you had a, a regular meeting, uh, uh, what I will do is that I will stop the meeting here and let the people reset their neurons and they get for the next presentation. It's very difficult to present something after such a lovely lecture uh, delivered today by Josefina. But since I'm the organizer of the meeting, then I decided that someone from the lab is going to present uh, here uh, today and the, uh, the title of our presentation is Swapping uh, Mosquito Durante Receptor Domains to Probe uh, Specificity. Uh, so uh, this work here started a uh, number of years ago uh, by Ping Shi Xu in the lab. And the, uh, more uh, later on, uh, Flavia Franco joined us and she started to work in, in this project. So Flavia, would be the best person to do this presentation today, but she has something more important to do. Uh, so Davi came into this world in July uh, 22nd. So now she's taking care of Davi full time. She doesn't have the time to present here. So I'm presenting in her place. And the, we already sent it to Davi. Uh, she shot for the, from the California Academy of Science and the periodic table that's assignment for him to memorize in the next couple of months. So we're going to be talking here, going back to 2010, when we, we uh, deophonized this receptor CQOR10 uh, from the mosquito Culex quinquefaciatus that responded to Scatol. Scatol is a known uh, oviposition uh, uh, attractant that was discovered by John Pickett and many others uh, later on uh, previously. And the, uh, we find this receptor that is very specifically tuned to SCATOL and it responds with high sensitivity. The same here, we deophanize also a receptor uh, CQR2, which became a very important receptor because now autolog of this receptor have been found in so many other species of mosquitoes and also outside of mosquitoes, as we're going to see here today with the presentation of the Jason Pitts that's going to present some uh, information, new information about this receptor, the ortholog of this receptor in the house fly. So CQR10, which is now also called CQR21, I'm going to keep the old name to make it simple, uh, is very specific as you see here in the dose dependency response, very specific to SCATOL, but it also does respond with a lower response to indole. On the other hand, uh, CQR2, uh, which is now also called CQR121, it responds better to uh, indole uh, rather than scatol, and it gives a very low response to scatol. So basically, these two receptors have the reverse in terms of specificity, and we thought that it would be a very important case for us uh, to study here, because then we have two receptors that just have reverse specificity. And the CQR2 uh, is also less sensitive than SCATOL, the SCATOL receptor CQR10. SCATOL is three methyl indole and the uh, indole. So the difference is that one has an extra methyl group uh, that has to be detected. As, and the, everything throughout the presentation today, I'm going to use the red colors for CQR10 and the SCATOL and the blue colors for indole and the CQOR2. So at that time, there was no structure of uh, uh, receptors. We started looking at these two receptors. We compared the two receptors and then we predicted the transmembrane domains because uh, we believe that the transmembrane domain then uh, is uh, where resides the bind pocket. So we look at this transmembrane domain uh, predicting by octopus. So we predicted that. And as you see here, uh, everything in red is for OR10, 
and everything is blue is for R2. So we have now uh, the prediction of this uh, two uh, seven transmembrana for these two receptors. Later on, way later on, in 2018, uh, the first structure of a receptor for the structure of Orco was published by the group of Vanessa Ruta. And in that point, uh, they don't talk about the transmembrana domains anymore because they found that some helical segments go extrude the transmembrane and go out of the transmembrane. So in other words, they found nine segments, nine helical segments, seven of them transpass the membrane. So they call them S0, S1, S2, and so on and so forth, until SC7A and 7B. At that point, we ask the question ourselves, is that the prediction that we use of octopasses reliable for our work or not? So we pick up the primary structure of this receptor, and we applied octopus, and then we look at what they would be the so-called transmembrane. And then we found here for octopus that this picked now in gray, that it fits nicely with that what they have found by cryo EN. So it gave us the confidence that yes, this transmembrane domains, the prediction is very good, and everything that we have done so far, we can continue doing that because we are using a prediction that's very close to reality as far as this receptor is concerned. So we have here CQR10 that has seven transmembranes, as you know, these receptors, and the uh, CQR2 that also with the seven transmembrane uh, highlighted here. Again, OR2 is red and OR10 is red, OR2 is blue. So what we did is that what swapped this domain? We pick up, for example, one domain uh, from uh, the OR2 and place it in OR10. Again, the basis is OR10 because it was the most specific and it responded to SCATOL. And then we make this uh, uh, swapping in this domain. So when we swap this domain, for example, here M1 and M4, we call that mutant CQR10 M1 M4. Uh, there is no better name in the literature. I try to look at the uh, the nomenclature for these mutants, but I could not find anything better. So every time we make one of these mutants, we combine with coin jack in the outside with orco. And I want to, uh, to emphasize that because this here, as opposed to the receptor that Josefina just reported today, this guy is here, they require a mandatory core receptor CQ orco. Okay, so we express it all. Throughout the presentation, I'm not going to mention orco anymore, but it's implied that every time that I say that we express this mutant, it means that we co-express that with the mandatory core receptor orco. And in this case in here, when the, we swap the seven transmembrane, there was no response. We swap it uh, one, two, three, five, six, and there was no response whatsoever. When we swap one, there was no response again. And this two, there was no response. And finally, when we swap it transmembrane three, we saw uh, that it, it changed a little bit the sensitivity, but the specificity remains the same. Namely, uh, this receptor responded better to SCATOL and uh, with lower sensitivity, but responding uh, with lower response to indole. So here's the comparison, the two same time scale, so that you see that we lost the sensitivity, but uh, the specificity is still the same. Same thing with ME4. Uh, the receptor remains specific to SCATOL, but with lower sensitivity, as you see here, comparing in the same uh, scale. When we look at the M5, then we know that the specificity remains the same, but the sensitivity became so much higher. Uh, now we are going to compare here that we remove this receptor. If we put the CQR10 in the same time scales as the mutant, you see that CQR10 has a lower uh, response compared to this mutant. In other words, this mutant M5, it's very important to remember M5, uh, is much more sensitive. And the same thing happened here with M6, if you mutated that, uh, and you have now a mutation that it has uh, swapped that domain, uh, it's a much more sensitive, but still the more important question that you want to address is the specificity remains the same. Uh, M7, uh, doing the same thing here with comparable sensitivity, didn't change much, it's not surprising, after see that the M7 is part of the channel. Uh, so in summary here, we have 
uh, M1, M2, M3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. No activity, no activity, uh, M3, M4. Lower sensitivity, but still specific to the same as Scatol. Uh, same thing with M5 and M6, still specific to Scatol. Higher sensitivity and M7 compare sensitivity. I know that's a 24 hours uh, symposium, but 24 hours for everyone combined. So I'm going to speed up a little bit here and to show some of the other mutants that we do did uh, again. Uh, and we see three, uh, here four, three, four, five, six uh, all respond in the same way, but uh, lower sensitivity now. And four, five, six, three, five, six, and again. Uh, we are seeing the same type of response, higher uh, specificity to scatol as compared to indol. Uh, and the summary here, uh, three and four is comparable, three and five is slightly higher sensitivity, three and six lower sensitivity, three and seven comparable. Uh, and again, the, the four and the five, four and the six and the four and the seven, one of them gave higher sensitivity, the other ones gave comparable sensitivity. Uh, five and six, five and seven, comparable, and the higher sensitivity, and six and seven, uh, we now have, again, higher sensitivity. Uh, then we decide, okay, let's go back to this one and the two, because one and the two, when we mutated the only one, or mutate only two, we lost the activity altogether. So we went back and said, let's make a combination now of one and something else. So if one and the two, no activity, one in the three, no activity, one in the four, no activity, one in the five, no activity, one in six, and one in seven, no activity whatsoever. It's very disappointing when you find no activity. Uh, and then we mutate now combination of two and something else. Two and the three, no activity, two and the four, no activity, two and five, no activity, two and six, no activity. And finally, when we mutate two and seven, we got the reverse uh, specificity that you are looking for. Specifically, uh, this receptor responds better to scatol. But now when you mutate two and seven, uh, and it has to be the two of them, because if you mutate two only or seven only, we don't achieve that. But if you mutate two and seven, the receptor now is responding better to indole as opposed to scatol. You see here, going in the trace from the left, you are having here uh, 10 to minus 6, one in micromolar dose, and we have here the response to scatol. Remember, scatol is red, uh, indol is blue, and you see a uh, better response for indol, and we increase the concentration to 10 to minus 5, scatol, and indol, much better response, and 10 to minus 4, uh, scatol and indol. So you look at that in the, in the uh, dose dependence with uh, multiple cases, then we see very clearly now that you reverse what we have for uh, the original, the wild type of receptor, CQ10. CQ10 responds better to uh, escatol if a lower response to indole. And the, if you compare it, this response, yes, the response is uh, small. It's not as robust as the response of CQ10. But we want to remind you that CQ2 itself is also having a uh, lower uh, response. So if you put it here, almost in the same type of scale, and you see that the, resp the response is comparable to the response of the wild type CQ2. Again, we mutated CQ10, and the membrane 2 and 7 have been now uh, borrowed from the sequence from CQ2. Another important marker for these uh, receptors, for the difference of the two receptors, is this phenolic compounds. Not the major compounds, but they also respond secondarily to this phenolic compound. CQ10 responds to phenol, 3,5-dimethylphenol, the compound in green, the middle, and the 2 methylphenol the orange compound on the right. Uh, CQ2, uh, on the other hand, uh, responds only to phenol and to 2 uh, methylphenol it does not respond to 3,5-dimethylphenol as the case uh, with the CQ10. And now, when you look at the mutant, the 2,7, the mutant 2,7, it reproduces uh, the behavior of CQ2. It responds to phenol. It does not respond to 3-dimethylphenol as the case of CQ2 and responds to 2-methylphenol. 
So uh, it's look at this major response that is Katol and Indol, and also to the secondary response, we switch the specificity of this receptor by mutated two and seven. If you mutate two alone, we don't achieve that. If you mutate seven alone, we don't achieve that. But when we mutate two and seven, uh, we reverse the specificity of the receptor. It's very intriguing to us too. You might recall that in doing this presentation, I know there are too many graphs, but you might recall that M5 and M6 increase the sensitivity. That's what was not looking for. We're looking for specificity, but we could not escape our attention that the M5 and the M6 increase the sensitivity. Then we ask the question here, what if you pick up M2 and 7 and add also the mutation 5 and 6? So that for that, we prepare this mutation mutant here, 2, 5, 6, and 7. And the one co-express with Orco gave this profile here. That's exactly the same with the indole being the major response, but they also, uh, and you see here, very steep response with a much higher sensitivity as compared to M2 and M7. So in other words, we have now a mutant that is reverses the specificity of the receptor. When you look at the work that was just presented in here, it was published uh, last week in Nature uh, by Josephine and, and others. Uh, we look at this structure here and reveal the, the bind pocket that the, uh, she explained to, to us today again, uh, that has a lead formed by tryptophan 158 and the two residues on the base, uh, tyrosine 383 and the also uh, tyrosine 91. Tyrosine 91 is part of SC2. And there's other, other residues that are surrounding the contour of that bind pocket. And she talked about this hydrophobic residues and she highlighted today uh, tyrosine 380, uh, methionine 209, isoleucine 213, and the phenylalanine 92, which is also part of uh, the same ME2, which is equivalent to the S2 in case of the receptor that she just reported today. Well, we do not believe that this uh, change in specificity is related to the uh, to these two residues that it was highlighted here, uh, the tyrosine and the phenylalanine 91 and 92 respectively, because in her sequence highlighted in here in white and in our sequence uh, for uh, CQOR10 and for CQOR2, highlighted in red and in blue, respectively, uh, these residues are well conserved. So we believe that somewhere else in the uh, transmembrane 2 or in the segment 2 that is causing uh, this change in the specificity. And it's hard to, to conceive the, how this uh, uh, S7 is participating in that, but the experimental data shows that we have to have a combination of the two. M2 and M7 cannot have M2 alone be mutated and change this specificity. So it seems that in some way, M7, although uh, far from the bind pocket, M7 that we know now that is part of the forming the ion channel is somewhat uh, interacting with this M2 and causing this change in specificity. So that's the story. Uh, from uh, Flavia uh, today and Ping Shi and myself. We thank the uh, National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases for the support for this work. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move it to questions and answers. Uh, do you have any questions so far? Hi, yes, we do have a question here from an anonymous attendee and it reads, how many mutants of CQOR10, did you prepare? How many mutants? Okay, so if uh, we had to work it smart in here because if you do all the mutants, well, I think would it be 130 mutants that would be necessary. We did four to one mutants. We didn't present all of them today, but we did four to one mutants uh, uh, to achieve that place where we want it to be. That would be a place that we see uh, a reverse of a specificity, namely we wanted to find one that responds better to indole and secondarily to scatol. Uh, 
And that was the case of ME2 and ME7. If Efrain, it looks like there is another, another question there from anonymous one, right? Yes, yes, another anonymous question here. And it reads, what is the role of M7 in the specificity of the receptor? So that is, I should ask Josefina, not me. Uh, <laughs> and this is a, it's a very intriguing question. Josefina, by the way, uh, watching this thing, did, did you, do you have any insights for us? I don't want to put you on the spot. It's my presentation that's not <laughs> yours. But uh, have, do you have any insights that uh, how it's possible that this M7 would it contribute somehow, somehow to the uh, the, the reverse of this specificity. Um, I, it's, it's very interesting, and I was actually going to ask you um, if you measure the um, ion selectivity, for example, or any other um, gating parameter. Um, because one one thing that we haven't really explored much um, is um, the gating issue, and whether different uh, recept different uh, ligands in the binding pocket can elicit changes, for example. Um, in the pore in terms of how wide it, op it opens or how it's uh, linked to the pocket. This isn't the most um, um, standard way of, uh, for ion channels to operate. Typically the pore opens the same for most, for, for any, any, any gating. Um, but this is a distinct possibility that if we look at the ion selectivity, for example, and if we see the different, um, different ligands can elicit different um, or change the pore in different ways that might help explain this a little bit. I, I will go back to, to, to address that, that issue, but it looks like Karen Menuzi has some uh, comments or some questions. Karen? Yeah, I was just wondering, is it possible that M7 is involved in access of the odorant to the pocket? Because it's the pocket from the structures looks like it's a little bit in the middle of a lot of domains and that it's somehow going to have to find its way in. Is it possible that that or do we have an idea of how the odorant actually moves into the pocket? So going back to, to Josefina's question, uh, uh, we haven't uh, we have only tested the, the oocytes, the response from the oocyte. Uh, we didn't have measured the, the ion response, but the, uh, we can do that in the in the future. Uh, but this question how of the access, I think you have a better handle on that, Josefina, than than we do. Um yeah, I was I actually was um going to ask you, I don't know if I've seen this in the slide, but how long is the C-term? Um, so typically a lot of ORs have an extra little segment after the pore that can be a variable site. And that's something that we don't model. I don't see it in my structure. There's five residues at the end of the C-term, so at the end of the pore that I don't see in the structure and are extracellular. Um, and in some ORs, it can be much larger. So I was going to ask you, because I don't remember from the slides, if you have a very largely protruding C-term um, which it could, could participate as Karen suggested somehow. It, 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 it's not involving our mutation, the, the extruding part of it. It's not involving our mutation, but on a separate work, we did some um, uh, 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 removing one uh, uh, residue at a time. And the, we found that the, I think the two residues uh, was the maximum that they could support. And then the sensitivity is kind of going down and completely dis uh, disappeared the, the response. So. Uh, I don't think from, from the prediction uh, we didn't get this, uh, the the X, this uh, C terminus is outside, uh, so we did not involve in the swapping. Efrain, do, do you have any other additional question there? No. Yes, we do. Uh, we actually have a question from YouTube, and it states: Have you ever point mutated CQOR10 to evaluate the structure of its binding pocket? Very good question. Actually, last night, Pingy, she came to me with a very nice set of data, but I don't like to show data uh, before we s uh, make sure everything is, uh, you know, cross the T's and uh, dot the I's uh, before you go public on that. But uh, we, we are work on that. It's a very, very good question. Uh, every time that we get a question that we know the answer, so yeah, it's a very good question, right? Uh, this is an excellent one because we had it. Some some insights last night, but I didn't want to to include here today. I, 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 we have to wait a little bit for for later. Uh, so it looks like we are almost there in the time. Yeah, we are right there on the time. So let's move on. Let's move on to the uh, next presentation. Let's start sharing here. Uh, and the next speaker comes from us from the great state of Texas. 
uh, Jason Pitts uh, coming to us here today. Where is the stop sharing here? So things move around because I was presenting. Uh, Jason Pitts is uh, one of the nicest guy in the field coming from us now from Waco, Texas, from Baylor University. Jason, the floor is yours. Thank you, Walter. I appreciate that and uh, appreciate the chance to um, engage with this global community today and talk about some of the work that we are delving into in, as the title suggests, in Houseflies, Musca Domestica. Uh, Walter, I just want to say thanks also for putting me right behind Josefina's great talk and yours. So uh, <laughs> hopefully mine will complement what, uh, what you've learned already today and what you've told us. I want to acknowledge right up front uh, my co-authors, Robert Huff, who is a a uh, talented PhD student in my lab, Shen Yu Shi, who is a former lab technician and my close uh, confidant and colleague, Jonathan Bobat from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. If you see any nice figures in my presentation today, they were probably created by Jonathan. So I just wanna put that right out there. So my interest in uh, olfaction and insects uh, is longstanding and mostly I have studied uh, mosquitoes and chemosensation broadly in um, vector species like Anopheles gambia with Larry's Wabell at Vanderbilt uh, in 80s vectors now in my own lab here at Baylor. But of late, I've become very interested in houseflies and not in any small part due to their status as uh, mechanical vectors of pathogens worldwide. Houseflies are arguably some of the most, one of the most successful species, um, uh, invasive species around the world. They of course are very cosmopolitan. They're commensal with human populations everywhere in rural and urban settings uh, and in part because of that close relationship with humans and human populations. Uh, they are in close contact as let's call them filth flies broadly speaking uh, with domestic animals, with garbage, with rotting uh, or decaying organic matter and in the process of uh, moving between food sources and oviposition sites they can pick up uh, microorganisms. This is a nice figure from a review from Travel Medicine and Infectious Disease, uh, uh, schematically depicting that kind of mechanical transmission that can occur. So simply picking up microorganisms uh, in the environment and then transmitting them or transferring them mechanically to food sources, for example, can lead to intestinal diseases uh, in humans. Um, also, there is uh, the viability of these microorganisms in the alimentary canal, in the crop, uh, in the gut, and so those can be regurgitated by flies when they feed or defecated again and ingested by humans and, and cause disease. So here's just a short list of some of the pathogens that have been at least um, potentially implicated as being transmissible by flies. Salmonella typhi, which is the causative agent of typhoid fever, vibrio cholerae, cholera, etc. So of course their vector status is important, but I would also put out to you today, and I think it's not a big sell for this community, uh, that Muska can also serve as a kind of second model in terms of Diptera and the Matacera specifically uh, for understanding olfaction and chemosensation in flies. So several years ago now, seven years ago, I guess almost, uh, the genome of the house fly was described uh, and published. And so along with that uh, information came the annotation of this genome and the description of a family of odorant receptors, which I'll focus on today. So we'll, we'll put aside the other large families of chemoreceptors in flies and talk about the odorant receptors today. They were described in that uh, initial annotation, something like around 75 odorant receptors, which is uh, on the same order of receptors encoded to, uh, in the genomes of other fly species, Drosophila having maybe a few fewer. So I've just simply taken those annotations, the amino acid conceptual translations of those genes, and I have aligned them and generated a neighbor joining tree uh, with Drosophila uh, receptor specifically, just as an, an entree point uh, to begin to, to try to get some insight into uh, the relationships between Drosophila receptors and housefly receptors. And so that's what this tree represents. It's rooted with Orco, which of course is highly conserved. There's a clear ortholog in Musca domestica here. And just to remind you how odorant reception works is if you need a reminding, but these are multimeric complexes, this dimer that's indicated here with Orco as the co-receptor is probably not the case, most like the tetramer uh, as we've heard today. And odorant receptors, of course, are expressed in odorant receptor neurons in scintilla on the antenna, uh, 
and perhaps in other structures um, in insects. And they are largely, so far as we understand, responsible for volatile odor detection for chemical classes like alcohols, aldehydes, et cetera, that are being emanated by natural sources, flowers, microorganisms, uh, and other um, organisms like animals and domestic animals, even wild animals, of course, in environments. And so this is the basis for detection for volatile odors. So what can we gain from this kind of information? Well, we can begin to ask questions about, are there known uh, volatile odor detectors or receptors in uh, fruit flies or vinegar flies, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, that might give us some insights into um, Muska domestic uh, activity, at least functional activity of these receptors. So I'm presenting a, a few alignments here today. I will say in general that the OR family in house flies is quite divergent, as you might expect. So there, there aren't necessarily a lot of um, really strong homologs, even between Drosophila uh, and Musca domestica. But here are a couple of examples. I've aligned OR10A from Drosophila with its apparent homolog in Musca domestica. And you can see in the gray boxes here are identical residues, and in bold are the uh, similar residues. So here's one that's about 45% identical. So there are varying degrees of homology. Here's another example of OR13A aligned with a, a homolog from Musca domestica, which shows higher homology, maybe on the order of 50 to 60%, 55%. So that's of interest. And, and we would like to begin to characterize functionally uh, using heterologous cells, uh, the functionality of these receptors in house flies. But right away, one thing jumped out at us um, and that is that there are close homologs to some receptors that we think of as candidate, at least endallergic receptors. And I'll, I'll credit Jonathan Bobot for using that terminology first, but the endallergic system being compounds that are have indole as a structural backbone. Okay, and Walter's already described those receptors in mosquitoes. So we see these relationships between housefly uh, receptors and Drosophila receptors, but we really up to this point, don't know exactly what these Drosophila receptors are doing functionally, although we suspect that they are responding to indolic type compounds. And so here's an alignment of now a mosquito, Aedes aegypti, or two apologies to Walter for not using the Culex orthologs here, but these are Aedes aegypti, aegypti receptors, OR2 and OR10, and they're close homologs, OR49B in the case of OR2 from Drosophila and from Musca domestica, and OR9, which also has a paralog in mosquitoes, that's OR10, and the close homologs of uh, OR30A in the case of fruit flies and house flies. And so uh, there's some longstanding work from Walter's group and others and Jonathan Bobot's group that describe functionality as Walter also described, where R2 seem to be uh, much more selective for indole or specific for indole as opposed to 3-methyl indole. Uh, or scatol, res ORs 9 and 10, uh, seem to be not only specific or much more uh, active, uh, much more potent, uh, scatol is a much more potent ligand for these receptors, but there's some interesting differential expression of these receptors where OR9 and OR2 are expressed in the larval antenna, so during the aquatic life stages of Aedes aegypti, and ORs 2 and 10 are in the adult antenna. And so that leads us to some interesting, I think, hypotheses about the impact of these receptors in the life histories of, of mosquitoes. So we have, uh, as I mentioned before, used the heterologous system uh, to express these receptors. We use xenopus oocytes and two electrode voltage clamping. And we express, in this case, um, the OR49B uh, receptor along with the Musca domestica orco. So these are matched in terms of their species. And what we found in our initial screens with blends, we use a, a combination of blends of, uh, in, in, in total, something like 200 to 250 odors. Uh, they're not necessarily random odors. They're odors that we have selected because um, in the literature, they have had some impact on potentially on mosquitoes, but other insects in terms of behavior. And so what we found was these, this receptor indeed, I'm not showing that data here, was highly selective for our indole blend and showed very, very low level amplitude responses to any other blend. And then within our indole uh, blend, we broke out the individual compounds, about a dozen or so of them. Lo and behold, OR49B in fact responds very well uh, with high uh, specificity to indole as opposed to the other indolic compounds. And here you can see a, a single oocyte tracing to, um, in response to various concentrations, 
of indole and three methyl indole, which were the two most efficacious ligands in this study. And here we're showing the results of those CRCs and the EC50 values here in the case of indole with OR49 in the high nanomolar range, but at least an order of magnitude lower in terms of the EC50 than the response to um, that's elicited by 3-methyl indole. So that was very exciting. We went on to do similar work with OR30A and found, interestingly, that the reverse uh, specificity, as is the case for mosquitoes, was evident. So OR30A in combination with ORCO in the heterologous system showed highest efficacy um, three for 3-methyl indole. Five minutes. And Yes, and that was also evident in terms of the EC50, the potency. So again, in this sort of mid-level nanomolar range in our hands, but an order of magnitude better for scatol or 3-methyl indole than for indole itself. We've also done some RNA sequencing and expression profiling in antenna of males and females. So what I'm showing here is the result of that in transcripts per million for female antenna and male antenna. What's shown here in this kind of uh, color intensity uh, depiction are, is the um, average of a biological replicate for each um, uh, male and female antenna samples. Here's ORCO at its highest expression in the antenna. And then for the other potential indolic receptors, we see uh, expression that's similar between both males and females. And we've also done some RT-PCR, just simple endpoint uh, with minus RT controls here uh, and primers that span exon junctions and we've sequenced these bands and been able to show that, in fact, we can confirm uh, by another method that these receptors are expressed there. There are some other interesting aspects to this RNA-seq study that I won't go into, but there are some apparently differentially expressed receptors here. I'll just point to one of them here, this particular receptor. And we think that those may be involved in uh, possibly in um, sexual communication, in, uh, especially in mating behavior uh, in musca domestica that parallels that in fruit flies. In the broader context, and this is what my colleague Jonathan Bobot will be speaking about uh, during the European side of the 24 hours of insect olfaction and taste, is that we've looked at homologs for these receptors in the available dipterin genomes. So SETI flies, so Glossina, uh, all of the anopheline genomes that are available um, in the Psychotidae or the sand flies, uh, and in the available nematocerin, other nematocerin um, genomes. And we find very good homologs there. So here's an example of an alignment between Drosophila, Glossina morsitans, houseflies, and Stomoxis calcitrans, OR30A. So we would predict from this that these are going to be endolic receptors. We would also predict that they would have this um, specificity to indole and 3-methyl indole. And so that is something that we will be actively pursuing. So back to fly chemical ecology, I think this is a, an important entree into um, learning more about uh, house flies uh, and their interactions with the chemical environment. Um, we have this model now where OR30A is selected for 3 methyl indole, and that could impact female OV position, for example, uh, whereas OR49B and its indolic uh, response may impact feeding in both sexes. Um, of course, 30A is expressed in both sexes, so there's a lot to do to begin to tease apart what these roles may be, if there are any differences between the sexes. This is a poster that I pulled out from uh, found on the web, it's from World War II, uh, showing again that um, flies are breed in open latrines and trash and they're mm -hmm. you know, very close um, association with humans. Uh, future directions that I think are kind of obvious, at least for the start of this project, we have uploaded a preprint or a pre-article in BioArchive. You can look at this information for yourself. Uh, I wanna thank everybody in my lab. This is a, a bit of an older picture. Um, we haven't been this close together for a while in my lab. Um, and this is Robert Huff, Shen Yushi, and our colleague at, in Israel, Jonathan Bobat, um, who continues to inspire me with his insatiable curiosity and his drive to succeed. Thanks to our mosquito funding sources, the NIAID and the AMCA. And as a shameless plug, I'd like to say that we're looking for a postdoc in electrophysiology. So if you might be interested in work in mosquitoes and houseflies and other vector insects, uh, please contact me. Here's my email address. I will stop there and say thank you and take your questions. And I've stopped sharing. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank, <laughs> Jonathan thank you, Jason, uh, <laughs> very much. That uh, I think is uh, entirely a new set of, uh, of data. That's what's interesting about these meetings is to, to share new data. Uh, and let's see if the questions are going to be coming here.
Uh, are there any questions so far, uh, Efraim? So far, I do not see any questions on the Q&A um, or from other fellow panelists. Okay, very good. Uh, so uh, you have been looking at these receptors and compare with the receptors for mosquitoes. And by the way, uh, I kept the name uh, OR2 and OR10 and then use the new nomenclature because I know that in, in Aedes and the Anopheles, they still they, they have the same names, 2 and 10. And the apologies to Sharon Hill and the others that they renamed these uh, olfactory receptors in Culex quinquefaciates, but I thought it would be a little bit confusing to use it, the new nomenclature of OR21 and the 121 uh, So that's a very nice insight from, from the house fly now with these uh, two receptors, 30A respond to SCATO and 49B respond to indole. Uh, do you have any, any new information about it, uh, anything about the, the, the specificity? Or, we are looking at that now with, with Culex mosquitoes, but have you been looking at the, anything related to that in your lab, or Jonathan's lab? Not especially at the moment, Jonathan, probably more so than, than my group. But I guess another comment I would have about this work, as I alluded to early on, is that not only the vector status of, of houseflies makes um, trying to understand their uh, interactions with the world around them important, but also this could play into uh, helping modeling for how photoreceptors are binding ligands like indol, um, because we do see these uh, selective receptors. And so I think that more of this kind of work is needed um, in terms of input into, into modeling. So I would make you the argument in general that uh, the more we learn about functionality of these receptors, even in heterologous systems that we use, um, the better off, the better those predictions or um, uh, may become. Uh, there is a question, uh, Leslie Volshaw has a question. Uh, Leslie, uh, would you like to state the question on the microphone? I saw, the, I saw in the question the answer there, she's asking a question, but maybe the microphone is not available at the time, she can come later. In though it's such an important compound, so it's not surprising, right, Jason, that you find uh, receptors in, in the various species res, uh, respond to this compound. It's, it's surprising that it, they have specificities, uh, like you said, it's more selective toward in also, it hints to some very important role for the, the chemical ecology of this uh, insect, right? Yeah, and indole is, a, as, as you know, it's a fairly ubiquitous compound in nature. So, um, and, and I find it really fascinating in terms of odor coding that um, I think we, we have a lot to learn about how, what are the similarities in, in terms of evolution of odor receptors for these compounds across um, the kingdom of uh, the animal kingdom? How is it that um, not only insects are able to detect these ubiquitous compounds, but uh, mammals, for example, uh, as well. And so maybe we'll get some insights into um, evolution of these receptors, very broadly speaking, by, again, by doing these kinds of deorphanization, uh, deorphanizations of families of receptors. But yeah, indole is sort of the low-hanging fruit in these receptors, admittedly. I think I, I, think I, I misread the uh, statement from Leslie here. She was pointing out to a question of a honey. Honey, uh, do you want to state your question here? We have two minutes left. I just want to say we identified in the Rosofla Melangasa an OR called OR43A as well, responding to missile indole. So maybe this is helpful for us. Yes, Hanny, I should have recognized that. Thank you for saying that. And also it's, it's of course, in that uh, clade with uh, the candidate indolic receptors. So yes, sure. having some prior information there is really useful. And I think that that's also something that others are pursuing at the moment. Um, the roles of these Drosophila ORs, these three in particular that I mentioned um, in terms of indolic response. A very brief question from John Pickett. John? Yeah, just to observe, obviously finding this high specificity for discriminating between uh, methyl indole, scatol, and indole itself. Uh, and that very nice idea that uh, Jason had about looking at the ecology of it is obviously a nice way there. We must also look at the biogeneration 
because these are very similar compounds, but there are differences in the way mm -hmm. they're generated. And that will be the ultimate clue, I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We now move on to the next speaker, coming us from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Chris Potter is going to be talking about the uh, olfactory response to insect repellents in Anophia malaria mosquitoes. Chris, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity to share our research with you today. So this is the insect I'm going to be talking about. This is the Anopheles mosquito, which is commonly referred to as the most dangerous animal on Earth. And this is because it's a vector for the plasmodium parasite that gives rise to malaria, the disease. Malaria kills about 400,000 people every year, and unfortunately, those numbers are going back up again. But lucky for us, mosquitoes use their sense of smell for pretty much all their behavioral decisions they make, including finding us and biting us. So the idea is that we can target their sense of smell to hopefully prevent them from finding us and biting us. So I'll give a quick introduction to the olfactory system in Anopheles mosquitoes. Um, shown here is a side profile of a female mosquito. So here we have its antenna. That's where most of the olfactory neurons are. It also has some olfactory neurons on the maxillary pulp and some olfactory neurons on the proboscis. At the very end of the proboscis, the structure called the labella. So our first goal, really, when we're getting into this, was to genetically target the mosquito olfactory system. So on the next slide, I'll just talk about how we go about doing that. So one of the goals of my lab is also to develop new genetic tools for working in mosquitoes. Um, and one of the ones that we've introduced is something we started originally in Drosophila, and now we're bringing it all over into the mosquito system. And this is the Q binary expression system. It's a two-part system. And so the way we use this for labeling olfactory neurons in Anopheles mosquitoes is that we use the ORCA promoter. So this is expressed in mostly olfactory neurons in the mosquito. And we use it to drive this QF2 transcription factor. So this is an exogenous transcription factor that originally came from Neurospora. So the way this works is that the QF2 transcription factor will bind its enhancer called QAS, turn on transcription, and you'll get protein expression. So in this case, we're expressing a membrane-targeted GFP. And so the way it works is you have two strains of mosquitoes, you cross them together and they bring these two components together. And so whenever these two components are together, you'll then get GFP expressed wherever ORCO is expressed. So this was pioneering work that was done by a former postdoc in the lab, uh, Lena Riabanina, um, who now has her own faculty position at Durham University. This is what it looks like. So it works beautifully well. This is, doesn't require staining or anything like that. This is just what it looks like uh, when you look under a dissecting microscope. So you can see here in green are the olfactory neurons that are on the antenna. There are these olfactory neurons that are on the maxillary pulp. And then you can see a clump down here in the labella. But the, the most important aspect of this though is that we now have genetic access to these olfactory neurons. And one of the simple things we can ask then is um, what are the brain regions that are targeted by these mosquito olfactory neurons? Now that we can actually label them, we can actually see where they go in the brain. And this is where we got our first surprise. So shown here is a brain of a mosquito. And so we did see, uh, uh, we did see innervation of olfactory neurons in the antenna lobe like we expected to see. And these are from the antenna and maxillary pulp. But what was a surprise to us is that we also saw olfactory neuron innervation in this region of the brain called the subesophageal zone. And from experiments I, experiments I can't go through here, we determined that those were coming from the labella. And so the subesophageal zone is canonically thought, at least in the insect brain, to be involved in taste and gustatory sensation. And so this was the first example where olfactory neurons are actually targeting this region of the brain. And just as a reminder, this is the labella. So this is the part that is really close to your skin while they're biting and they're gustatory and olfactory neurons there. And the mosquito does this really interesting behavior called tapping where she does this with her labella, she's tapping around looking for a blood vessel. And so at least in our brains, when we combine olfaction and taste together, we give rise to a sensation of flavor. So we like to think that maybe what the mosquito is doing when she's tapping is that she's essentially flavoring our skin to identify a good place to bite. But what, we'd also, what the other advantage of using just genetic access is that we can now turn it to a functional responses. Can we figure out how do insect um, repellents work? And this is something that is not well understood. 
And so th there are two broad categories of insect repellents. There are the man-made ones, which I've just diagrammed, just shown here in blue, and then the natural ones, which are shown here in green. So the most commonly used and the, the widest used one is DEET. Um, this is the gold standard of insect repellents. And there are some other synthetic um, insect repellents that are on the market. There's IR3535 and Picardin. Uh, there are natural repellents. So these ones are usually derived from plants. Um, so the one that has been uh, approved for use by the FDA is oil of lemon eucalyptus. The active ingredient is called PMD. And there's a number of other products you can buy um, that are also based on plants. So for example, lemongrass oil. What's surprising is that we don't really have a good understanding of how these insect repellents work, especially for the Anopheles mosquito. So this is work from another very talented postdoc in the lab, Ali Afifi. So what we can do, and this is the advantage of using this binary expression system, is that instead of expressing a membrane-targeted GFP, we can express another version of GFP that is a calcium sensor. This is called GCAMP. And so the way this works is that whenever, um, so when a neuron is activated, there's an influx of calcium. And what this molecule will do is it will fluoresce brighter. So this can be used as a proxy for neuronal activation. And so shown here on the right is the prep that Ali has come up with. So he has shoved a female mosquito, she's alive, she's perfectly happy, um, into this pipette tip and he's pinned down her antenna. And so we can look directly at the olfactory neurons. This, this is a living prep. So looking directly at her olfactory neurons, puff on an odor and see what happens. And so we can go to all those different repellents and ask, you know, what happens when you puff on these man-made repellents or what happens when you puff on a natural repellent? So I'll start first with the natural repellent example. So this is an example of what it looks like when you puff on, when you puff on um, lemongrass oil. So you'll see a little green there. So that's when you puff on lemongrass oil and you'll see that there are four olfactory neurons that are activated. Um, and shown here in the middle is a delta F. So this is the change in fluorescence. So these are the neurons that increase their fluorescence because of that G-camp molecule. And shown here is the activity profile. So you can see one of those neurons turned on and then turned off pretty rapidly, and then three of those had sustained activity. And this is true for all the natural appellants we looked at. So we've looked at over about 20 different natural appellants now, and each and every single one of them are activating some olfactory neurons on the mosquito antenna, and usually a very small number of discrete olfactory neurons, as you can see here for lemongrass oil. The surprise came, though, when we started looking at the man-made repellents, the synthetic repellents. So on this slide, I'm going to show you an example of the response to DEET. First, now we're looking at kind of more of a zoomed out view of the antenna. We're gonna puff on 2-acetylthiophene, which is an attractive odorant. And you'll see that when we puff this on, there's a great, beautiful response to a lot of the olfactory neurons in the antenna. And the surprise came when we puffed on DEET. So you'll see that in a second, we'll puff on DEET. And you see that we didn't see any response. We were expecting to see a whole bunch of olfactory neurons activated, but there was no response. We thought, well, when you're actually using DEET, you're mixing it with the odors that are on your skin. So what happens when we mix DEET with this particular odorant? And you can see the response on the bottom. So before we had a really strong response to this odorant, to acetylthiophene, but when it's mixed with DEET, there is no response anymore. So from these relatively simple experiments, we can conclude that DEET does not strongly activate any orcopositive olfactory neurons in the Anopheles mosquito, but what it is doing is it's preventing the activation of these odorants, presumably ones that would be attractive to a mosquito, from activating the olfactory neurons. And this is a process we call masking. So just to drive this point home, so here we have another prep of an antenna looking at one flagellomere. Um, this is just the basal fluorescence here on the left. These, there are neurons that respond to benzaldehyde. And you can see here, even if we use 100% concentrations of these odorants, DEET, IR3535, or Picardin, there is no activation of olfactory neurons and just a very minor activation of, from Picardin. So it suggests that these, these repellents, these synthetic repellents, are not strongly activating Anopheles olfactory neurons. What they are doing is masking. So this is just an example of what this means. So um, here we have four olfactory neurons that are activated by octanol. Um, they're just circled here. And so these four olfactory neurons um, have a delta F, a delta fluorescence. And what we can do is we can ask for those same four olfactory neurons when they're mixed with repellent, what does their activity profile look like? So here's an example for DEET. So for example, this so these different colors indicate different animals were tested. So octanol, each of these neurons will have a certain activity profile. 
And then when you take that octanol and mix it with DEET, for example, their activity goes down to base, directly baseline. And that's the same for IR3535 and Picardin. So what this indicates is that for Anopheles mosquitoes, they're not activating any olfactory neurons. And for the most part, what these respellents are doing is preventing other odorants from, being, from activating the olfactory system. And so I don't unfortunately have time to go into all the details, um, but we figured out that at least for Anopheles mosquitoes, the way this masking works is by reducing the volatility of the other odorants they're mixed with. So for example, when you mix DEET with octanol, there's just fewer octanol molecules that can reach the antenna. And we weren't the first ones to identify this. So the ability of DEET to do this was originally identified by Zayn Syed and Walter Real. So I think at this point, you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute. Um, I thought DEET was an insect repellent. I mean, it says so right on the can. Um, so maybe, you know, what's going on is that uh, we're not seeing any activity to orco positive olfactory neurons, neurons, but maybe it's activating something else that can cause it to be repellent to Anopheles mosquitoes. Okay. So we thought we should go ahead and just test this directly. And so we came up with a new behavioral assay, which we call the close proximity response assay. And this is a relatively simple assay. So we take a female mosquito, a single female mosquito, put her in a cage, and after we let her come to rest. So after she's been at rest for five minutes or longer, then we bring a pipette tip to her that contains the odorant in question. So for example, the repellent. And then we just watch what she does over the course of the next 30 seconds. If she's repelled by that odorant, then she'll jump off and fly away. If she's not repelled, then she'll just stay where she is. So this is what those result look, look, results look like for Anopheles mosquitoes. Um, here's the results for paraffin oil. Oh, I should mention that this is an individual animal uh, uh, assay. And so what we did, we did this 30 different times, so 30 different animals. And so what we're looking at in the Y axis here is the proportion of animals that remained over the course of the full 30 seconds. So you can see for paraffin oil, which is our negative control, they essentially ignored the fact that we had a pipette that contained paraffin oil. In contrast, when we do this with lemongrass oil, this is highly repellent. So within about two seconds, most of the mosquitoes had jumped away. The same for PMD. Um, within about five seconds, most of the animals had jumped away. So what about for DEET? So when we do that with DEET, there is pretty much no response. They, they could really care less that DEET was in this, in this odor tip. Um, and it's not significantly different from paraffin oil. And the same was true for Picardin and for IR3535. So what all you know, this indi in data indicates is that at least for Anopheles mosquitoes, the odors of these synthetic repellents are not repellent to Anopheles mosquitoes. But I will note that DEET is a repellent odor to Aedes and Culex mosquitoes. And this was work from Leslie Vossel's lab and also Walter Leal's lab um, with that found this. And we also dived a little bit deeper into this in Ollie's paper. So if you're interested in more details, feel free to take a look. Um, but I'd like to share in the last few minutes that I have, I'd like to share some more recent work that we're doing that we're pretty excited with. Um, so what we'd really like to do is to identify the odorant receptors that are activated by natural repellents. So for example, lemongrass oil and PMD. So just as a reminder, um, here we have lemongrass oil response and there were those four um, neurons that were activated. And so we're looking at one flagellomere, one segment of the antenna, which is about 135 microns. And so what Ali has done um, pretty amazingly is that he is able to cut off this tiny piece of tissue, it's about a 45 micron piece of tissue, isolate that piece of tissue, extract its RNA, and then we could do smart seek with that that piece of tissue. So what that does is it gives us a list of odorant receptors that are expressed on this small piece of tissue. And I think you'll notice that there are also some other olfactory neurons that come along for the ride, some background neurons. And so we're taking advantage of the fact that what we've noticed is that olfactory neurons tend to move around a little bit um, on the antenna. And so these background neurons will change from sample to sample. So we're not looking at just one sample, but we've done this 10 times. So we have 10 different samples collecting all the odor receptors that are expressed on those tiny samples. Each sample will have the activated neurons in a different subset of background neurons. And so what we do is we have these 10 samples, we then select them. So we say which ORs are the most highly expressed in each sample, which are the most abundant, and then which OR do we find in more than 90% of the samples. And when you do this, we get down to a list of 10 AGORs. And so we need to can't characterize these. So we do a functional characterization. And this is where we turn to Drosophila and the empty neuron system that was developed in the Carlson lab. And so very briefly, the way this works is that there is a neuron that can, is, expresses this odor receptor called OR22 A and B. Um, mutations of that leaves, gives rise to what's called an empty neuron. 
And then using the GAL4 UAS system, you can express Anopheles Gambi odorant receptor in that empty neuron. So now the response properties of that neuron depend on the odorant receptor you're expressing there. And then you can do a single syncytium recordings to look at the activity. And lucky for us, there's a large collection of these UAS AGORs that have already been developed by the Carlson lab. Um, of the 10 AGORs that we've identified in the tissue samples, half of them are in this collection and the other half we're making now. So this is just an example of what this looks like. So this is an example of AGOR10. Um, it's the A neuron that's expressing the ORs. That's the large spiking neuron. And you can see that when you puff on lemongrass oil onto, onto this um, neuron, there is pretty much no response to lemongrass oil. However, for another odorant we're calling ORA, when you puff this on, there's a very strong response. And so we know ORA is expressed in this tissue of interest. We came from the mosquito directly, and it also has this functional response to lemongrass oil. So it suggests that ORA is pot potentially one of the OR, one of the um, odor receptors in Anopheles that responds to lemongrass oil. And so the things we're doing now is making a knock-in of this. And what we're also interested in is not just looking at the orco positive neurons, but capturing all chemosensory receptor activities. And so to do this, we've made the first panneuronal knock-in for Anopheles caluciae mosquitoes. And so we were inspired by the work from Lindy McBride, which they published uh, last year. And so what they did was that they targeted the Brook pilot gene, which is a panneuronal synaptic protein, right before the stop codon, they inserted a T2A. QF I'm over, Chris. Please okay. summarize. Yep, um, this is it. This is the last slide. Um, and so this gives rise to a, a functional Brook pilot protein as well as a functional QF2. And so this is uh, what the brain looks like without this driver. And then this is what it looks like. So we've captured all the neurons, um, activity of all the neurons um, in the Synopheles caluciae mosquito. And more exciting for us is that we have access now, genetic access to all the peripheral neurons. So this is an example of the antenna and all the neurons in the feet. So now we can look at the chemosensory properties and all the um, sensory appendages. And just with that, um, I'd like to thank my amazing lab. Uh, lots of interesting stuff going on that I'll talk about hopefully some other time and then my funding sources. And I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, uh, let's uh, take a very brief question here because we're running out of time. Uh, I think there's one question here that's interesting and comment in, uh, on YouTube that's by LP Hall. Uh, Josefina showed that it did bind to o OR, but Chris has shown that it did, uh, is preventing OR from being uh, uh, activated. So there's a, there is a, a dichotomy there. Can you address that, Chris? Sure. So we find, at least for Anopheles odor receptors, there is no odor receptor that is strongly activated by DEET. This doesn't mean that the other odor receptors and other species don't bind deep. So this is found in, uh, Walter has found that like Culex 136 um, combined, uh, odor receptor 136 combined DEET and, and also a, like there's an 80s Egypti uh, odor receptor that can bind DEET. So it just means that for Anopheles that just, there is nothing, there's no odor receptor to bind DEET, but it doesn't mean that other insects can't do it. Uh, there's also one question here. Uh, can we use, uh, that's from Rui Shue. Uh, can we use your method to, uh, distinguishes spatial repellent in the topical repellents? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. That's a great question. So what we're looking at is specifically the spatial repellency, the ability of an odor to activate olfactory neurons. And so what we're looking for, for DEET, for example, is that for Anopheles mosquitoes, it's not working as a spatial repellent um, in the way that it, the odors itself does not repel mosquitoes. But we know from work from Leslie Vossel, for example, that there in the 80s Egypti, that DEET can activate neurons on the feet of mosquitoes, and that's how it can work as a contact repellent. So I think one of the reasons why DEET is so powerful is that it's doing multiple things. You know, at least it can, it can mask odors from coming off your skin, so it can prevent those odors from even getting to the mosquito. If it does happen to touch you um, and you're wearing DEET, then it can trigger this contact repellency. And so that's, it's doing multiple things, which is why it's so effective. Uh, so many interesting questions when we talk about DD. I don't have time to address it all. Uh, John Hildebrand is asking here if you have tested this uh, uh, with other, this behavior, I'll say, with other species of mosquitoes other than Anopheles. We did. So uh, we did test 80s Egypti mosquitoes and Culex quinquefaceitis mosquitoes as well. Um, and that's how we can tell that DEET 
is a good repellent, a spatial repellent for 80s and also for, for Culex. Um, but in for Anopheles, they pretty much ignore it. And, and Monica Stengel from, from Germany, there are so many good people there that we know very well attended this meeting, including Lynn Reedy for Bill Hanson, you, you name it in the attendance here today. But Monica is asking, can you please explain uh, with more detail how volatility of others is decreased via DIT and the other repellents, quote unquote repellents you use? Right. So we think it's because this DEET and these other repellents are just very low volatile odors to begin with. And it seems, you know, from what we can understand is that when you mix one odor with a very low volatile odor, then the odor, the volatility of the more it goes down in general. So DEET and these other uh, space, these other um, man-made repellents are just also very low volatile to begin with. So they reduce the volatility of anything you mix with them. Thank you very much, Chris. There are so many interesting questions here. Such a wonderful presentation. And uh, I understand that people have more questions, but we don't have much uh, time. 